a total loss of compressed air may mean a plant shutdown. You might think that this is a rather drastic statement, but think about all the equipment in your plant that is controlled by using compressed air. In fact, so much vital equipment is pneumatically operated that in many cases, losing the means to control or power that equipment would actually require shutting the plant down until repairs are made. Now that's where you come in. We need well-trained, fully informed personnel familiar with all aspects of air compressor maintenance, repair and operation to keep the plant running. For the remainder of this program, we're going to help you add to your skills as an air compressor mechanic. First, we'll be talking about the basic construction of a typical air compressor. Next, we'll discuss some routine maintenance jobs and troubleshooting techniques. Then, we'll see how compressor valves work and how they are repaired. Finally, we'll demonstrate disassembly, inspection, and reassembly techniques. We're going to use this particular air compressor for our demonstrations because it's a very common type used in industry. We categorize it as a double-acting, horizontal, two-cylinder, two-stage reciprocating compressor. Let's see why it's classified like this. You can tell that each cylinder is double-acting by looking at the arrangement of the valves. From this view, we can see two of the four inlet valves and two of the four discharge valves contained in this cylinder. When the piston moves to the right, it is compressing air on the right side while drawing air into the left side. When the piston moves to the left, it compresses the air it just drew in on the left side and draws air into the right side. This way, the compressor is drawing air in and compressing air on each stroke of the piston. We can see that the cylinders are both horizontal to the ground, so the compressor is called horizontal. In this compressor, we use two cylinders to compress air. After the first cylinder compresses the air, a second, smaller cylinder compresses that air again giving it a higher discharge pressure. In our discussions, we'll use one cylinder to describe the operation of the compressor. Both cylinders are identical except for their size. This arrangement is called a two-stage layout. The discharge of the first cylinder leads to the second stage cylinder, where it is compressed again before it is discharged from the unit. Finally, it's referred to as a reciprocating compressor because of the back and forth motion of the pistons. All of these features taken together give us the classification a double acting, horizontal, two cylinder, two stage, reciprocating air compressor. Before we locate and explain the function of the internal parts, let's take a look at the compressor from the front and identify the parts that we can see from the outside. Now from this view, we can see the inlet filter, the first stage, the intercooler, the second stage, and the motor. The inlet filter keeps abrasive dust and other impurities from entering the compressor. The first stage compresses the air, and the intercooler cools the air before it enters the second stage to be compressed again. The purpose of the motor is to drive the pistons. This cutaway side view enables us to see the internal parts of the first stage. As we said, the second stage is constructed identically, except that the cylinder and the valves are smaller. The second stage cylinder can be smaller than the first because the air from the first stage has already been compressed into a smaller space. We can also see the compressor's foundation, its casing, and the cylinder. Attached to each end of the cylinder are the heads, and they are commonly referred to as the top head and bottom head. The top head is where the piston stops when it's on an upstroke. The bottom head is where it stops on a downstroke. The foundation is a reinforced concrete pad which minimizes vibration by providing a firm base to counteract the movement of the parts inside. The casing is mounted on the foundation. All of the parts of the air compressor are supported by the casing, which also serves as an oil reservoir. Inside the compressor, we can see the main shaft coming from the motor. The motor turns the main shaft in a clockwise direction. A counterweight pressed onto the shaft serves three functions. First, since it's mounted off center, it balances the main shaft against the combined forces of the reciprocating connecting rod and piston. Second, it helps lubricate the compressor by splashing the oil from the reservoir up into the shaft bearings. On some compressors, though, an oil pump 
performs this function. Thirdly, the counterweight acts as a flywheel. Its weight helps the piston overcome air pressure during the compression stroke and keeps everything moving smoothly. The counterweight assembly has a crank pin opposite its main mass. The crank pin and its retaining plate attach the connecting rod to the counterweight, making the connecting rod move back and forth with a swinging, reciprocating motion as the counterweight rotates. The other end of the connecting rod rides on a pin on the crosshead. The crosshead changes the swinging, reciprocating connecting rod motion to a straight back-forth reciprocating movement. This crosshead has a wear shoe and a top and bottom guide. The wearing shoe and top guide have a shim adjustment to take up for wear while maintaining the alignment of the piston rod. The piston rod is screwed into the crosshead and held there by a lock nut and cotter pin. Further along the piston rod, we come to some oil wipers. Each oil wiper is made up of a series of thin blades that are held against the piston rod by a set of springs. The blades seal around the piston rod to keep crankcase oil in the crankcase. The piston rod is also sealed with packing. The packing rings are in a stuffing box which is mounted in the cylinder head. The packing keeps air in the cylinder from leaking out along the piston rod. The piston is bolted on to the end of the piston rod. Two piston rings form a sliding seal between the piston and the cylinder wall to keep pressurized air from leaking back around the piston. That covers the basic parts involved in the operation of a typical reciprocating air compressor. We briefly explain the function of each part and you'll see more about how each part relates to the others in the segments to come. In the next segment, we're going to deal with some of the routine maintenance and inspection techniques used to keep air compressors in service. Then, we'll discuss how to go about troubleshooting various problems which you might encounter. Before we go on, though, read section one of your text. Then, check with your instructor if you have any questions on what we've talked about so far. In the last segment, we saw some of the basic parts of a typical reciprocating compressor and learned a little bit about how they work together. Now, we're going to see some of the things that you have to do to keep a compressor working. First, we'll be talking about routine compressor maintenance, jobs that have to be done periodically to prevent breakdowns. After that, we'll see some examples of troubleshooting, procedures that help you track down and fix problems in compressors that aren't working properly. For reciprocating compressors, like the one in our example, routine maintenance items are the air filters, oil levels and lubrication, cooling water, packing, and oil wipers. Now let's go through them one by one. Air filters are first on our list. An obviously dirty filter, like this one, will starve a compressor for air by restricting intake air flow. Dirt and dust from the filter can also enter the valves and leave deposits that interfere with their operation. Dirty filters should be blown clean with low pressure compressed air or replaced entirely. Crankcase oil level is usually indicated in a sight glass. For the bearings to be properly lubricated, the sight glass should be filled up to the full mark or if the glass isn't marked, about halfway up. If the level's low, you'll have to add more oil. On many compressors, lube oil is also delivered to the cylinders through an oil pump and a lubricator. To keep a cylinder lubricated, oil has to be supplied at a certain rate. On this compressor, you check the rate by watching oil drops flow up a guide wire in a sight glass. The manufacturer's manual will tell you how many drops per minute. If the supply is blocked by dirt or sludge, the rate will slow down, or in severe cases, oil will pool on top of the glycerin. That's the mixture that fills the sight glass. If this is the case, no oil is reaching the cylinder, so you have to stop the compressor and clean out the oil lines. On many air compressors, cooling water flow is just as important as lubrication. 
the discharge line funnels should receive a steady flow of water from the water jackets and intercooler at all times. Insufficient flow can often be corrected by adjusting a valve. If it can't be adjusted to the right flow rate, you'll probably have to stop the compressor and clean out the intercooler water jackets and their water lines. Inspecting the packing around the piston rod is another routine maintenance task. Feel around the stuffing box and listen for any sounds of escaping air. Minor adjustments can be made by tightening the gland follower, but major air leaks mean that it's time to replace the packing. The last routine maintenance item is the oil wiper assembly. If oil is leaking out around the piston rod, the blades will probably have to be replaced since the friction of the wiper blades can wear down the piston rod. It's also a good idea to make a visual check of the rod's condition and replace it if you see excessive wear. Checking all of the items that we've talked about so far should be part of a continuous routine. Obviously, we can't guarantee that this type of inspection will eliminate major problems, but it will help ensure a long life and smooth operation for a compressor by catching small problems before they become big ones. But what happens when a problem is discovered during a routine check? Well, you'll probably be called on to troubleshoot the problem. That is, find out exactly what is causing a malfunction in the normal operation of the compressor. This requires that you not only know the specifics of the compressor, but also a few general guidelines for troubleshooting any compressor. In most cases, you'll be told that there's some problem with a particular compressor. And if possible, your first step is to talk to the operator who reported the problem. If not, check the operator's log and any other records kept as part of the compressor's machine history. In either case, there are several specific questions that you should have to answer. First, when did the problem begin? If it occurred suddenly, the problem could be breakage or complete failure of a part. If the problem developed over a period of weeks or months, it's most likely to be the result of wear rather than complete failure. Next, find out when the problem occurs. Does it happen all the time? Does it happen when the compressor is loaded? That is, when it's actually compressing air, or when the compressor is unloaded. Knowing when the problem happens can give you a clue to what's going wrong. For example, suppose you hear a knock. Now, if it comes from the compressor only when the unit is loaded, it's likely to be a valve knock. If the compressor knocks all the time, whether it's loaded or unloaded, it's not a valve. In an unloaded condition, there's no pressure to operate the valves, so the problem's either in the cylinder or in the bearings. Remember, anything that you can find out about the condition of the compressor is to your advantage, so get all of the facts. After you've found out all you can, now you're ready to make your own inspection of the unit. If the compressor is operating, your inspection will include looking, listening, and feeling for any problems. You should look for any signs of leaking oil or water and check gauges and sight glasses for any unusual readings. You should listen for any sounds of air leaks and unusual noises like knocks. You should also feel the unit for excessive vibration, temperature variation or hot spots, and for air, water or oil leaks. Now this process should be done slowly because not all problems are easy to spot. You may find the leak to be very slow, hardly detectable in fact. A hurried inspection may not catch it. So take your time when looking, listening, and feeling for any problem. It may save you time in the long run. Sometimes though, a compressor is shut down by the time you get to it. So looking, listening, and feeling will probably not reveal the problem. You may have to open up the compressor to find the trouble. Looking for problems by opening up a piece of equipment is usually a very time-consuming process. Valuable time can be lost by taking the equipment completely apart just to find the problem. By using the troubleshooting method of looking, listening, and feeling, you can often isolate the problem in a particular area and avoid taking the unit completely apart.
The operator who checked this compressor reported a knocking noise. Now a knock could mean anything from a bad valve to not enough lube oil. So now you have to pinpoint exactly where the knock is coming from. A stethoscope or sounding rod makes locating the noise easier. Be very careful when checking any operating compressor using instruments or tools. They can turn into dangerous missiles when they bounce off of rotating parts. Loose clothing should also be avoided. You could get pulled into the machine itself. After pinpointing the noise, you should check for other symptoms. If the knock is in the cylinder, the problem could be a valve, a loose piston, or piston rod, no lube oil, or a cylinder or piston that is worn or scored. If the knocking sound is caused by a valve, the valve would be hotter than normal. The valve could be loose and banging against the cylinder, causing friction. This friction could be the source of excess heat in the valve. Check for heat by feeling the valve or by using a pyrometer and comparing the reading to that of the other valves. A further check for a loose discharge valve could be the pressure of the discharge. If the valve is loose, the compressed air could leak back into the cylinder, causing the discharge pressure to be lower than normal. Be sure that you don't jump to conclusions. There are other reasons for a hot cylinder and a low discharge pressure. A worn piston or scored cylinder will also cause the cylinder temperature to go up and the discharge pressure to go down. But if the problem is a valve, only that valve will be hot and not the whole cylinder. A knock in the cylinder can also be caused by a lack of lube oil to the cylinder. Now, if you suspect that oil is not reaching the cylinder, stop the compressor immediately. It could be seriously damaged by letting it run without lubrication. No matter what symptom you come across, there are usually several possible causes. So always go one step further in your inspection before you draw any conclusions. You may find the solution to the problem is easier than you first suspected. Well, that concludes our discussion on routine inspection and troubleshooting techniques. In the following segments, we'll see how a typical compressor is overhauled. We'll see it in two parts, valve maintenance and cylinder and piston maintenance. For now, turn off the tape and review the material in section two of your text. When we return, we'll begin our compressor overhaul with valves. Before we discuss repairing compressor valves, we need to talk about the three types of valves you may come across. Feather, plate, and channel valves. All three types of valves work in much the same way, even though their construction varies. The basic parts common to all three are a valve seat, one or more movable parts usually held in place by spring tension, and a guard or stop plate. Here's how the parts work together in a discharge valve. As the piston compresses air in the cylinder, the pressure of the air rises, overcoming the spring tension and the air pressure in the discharge piping. When the piston reverses its stroke, the air pressure in the discharge piping and the spring tension in the valve overcome the air pressure in the cylinder. This pressure difference closes the valve, preventing air from returning to the cylinder. Keep in mind what we just saw was the operation of a discharge valve, but inlet valves work identically. Their operation is simply the opposite of the discharge valve. Well, now that you know basically how compressor valves work, let's look closer at each type and explain how it works in greater detail. We'll start with the feather valve. Now this example is two valves in one, an inlet valve and a discharge valve. The parts of this typical feather valve include a valve seat with two ports drilled through it and two feathers, one of which is visible here. The feathers are flexible strips of steel attached to one end of the seating surface by rivets. The upper feather acts as a discharge valve. The lower feather, the one you can't see, covers the other port and acts as an inlet valve. 
Above the seat and the feathers is a guard plate that contains an inlet port and a discharge pipe. On a downstroke, the pressure differential across the valve causes external air pressure to push open the lower feather, allowing air into the cylinder while holding the upper feather shut. On an upstroke, the pressure in the cylinder shuts the lower feather and pushes the upper feather open. Our second type of valve is the plate valve. It contains a valve seat, a guard plate, and a movable part called a valve plate. The valve plate is held against the seat by a series of coil springs. Now in this configuration, the air path between the inlet and the outlet is blocked. On an upstroke, air pressure in the cylinder overcomes both the pressure in the discharge piping and the spring tension, lifting the valve plate and unblocking the air path of the discharge piping. The motion of the valve plate is guided by two pins on the valve seat. After the compressed air in the cylinder escapes, the combination of the pressure in the discharge piping and spring tension is great enough to overcome air pressure in the cylinder. This causes the valve plate to shut, closing off any backflow of compressed air from the discharge piping. Now, our third type of valve is the channel valve. This is the type installed in the compressor that we're going to overhaul. First, let's look at its parts and then see how the valve moves. A channel valve is made up of three basic components, a valve seat, a stop plate, and the movable parts, the channels. In addition, it has channel guides and leaf springs. The channel in a channel valve acts like the feathers or valve plates in other valves. The channel sits on the valve seat and blocks the air path between the inlet and the outlet. A leaf spring holds the channel against the valve seat. The stop plate has raised areas that hold the leaf spring against the channel. The channel guide holds the channels and directs its up and down motion. Before we can fully understand how this channel valve moves, we need to look at exactly how the valve is positioned in the casing. There are two parts which hold the valve in place. The inner cover, which screws to the valve, and an outer cover that bolts to the cylinder's casing. The outer cover has a bolt which is threaded through the cover and presses on the inner cover to hold the valve in place. There's also a nut on the bolt, which prevents air from leaking out around the bolt. Since this is a discharge valve, the valve seat faces toward the cylinder. The seat of an inlet valve faces away from the cylinder. Now, if you remember this point about the orientation of the seat, you'll never make the mistake of reversing channel type discharge and inlet valves. Once this valve is properly placed in the casing, it works much the same as the feather and plate valves we've seen already. On an upstroke, the piston reduces the volume in the cylinder, compressing the air until its pressure is greater than the pressure in the discharge piping. Pressure in the cylinder then overcomes the discharge piping pressure and the spring tension, lifting the channel and allowing compressed air to flow out of the cylinder and into the discharge piping. After the air in the cylinder escapes, the pressure in the cylinder equals the pressure in the discharge piping and the channel closes. Well, now that we've seen the parts of a channel valve, how they work, and how the valve is held in place, we're going to take a look at the removal, inspection, and replacements of a typical channel valve. Before you begin any work, you must be sure to check that the compressor has been properly depressurized. To make sure of this, check your pressure gauges. If your compressor has any vent lines, be sure they're open to ensure that all pressures bled off. It's also necessary to make sure that all your plant's tagging procedures have been followed. To ignore either one of these precautions puts you in danger. If there's any pressure left in that compressor when you begin work, any one of its components could turn into a flying missile. When you have made sure that everything is in order, you can begin. First, to remove the valve, you have to break the nuts holding the outer cover free and remove them from their studs. When the last nut's been removed, lift the outer cover off and set it aside safely out of the way. Next, lift the valve out and remove the gaskets. The inner cover is fastened to the valve by two screws. After you remove the screws, you're ready to take the valve apart.
To take the valve apart, you remove these two screws on the valve seat. But be careful that the parts inside the valve don't fall out. If you're not going to replace the channels, mark them so you can be sure to replace them in the correct channel guides. Now this is important because each channel rubs against its guide in a particular way, forming a wear pattern. The friction between the parts causes this. Changing channel positions could interfere with the efficient operation of the valve. The next step in this operation is to pry out the channel guides. Once that's done, you're ready to clean all the valve surfaces. To do this, you use a solvent and a wire brush or scraper, but it must be done carefully. Avoid gouging the metal while scraping and be sure to use an approved solvent. For example, do not use a flammable solvent. Heat from the action of the compressor could cause a solvent to ignite or possibly explode. When cleaning the surfaces, check for excessive carbon buildup. The carbon should be in a thin, even layer. Now, if you notice any chunks of carbon, too much oil may be getting into the cylinder. If this is the problem, the cylinder lubricator should be adjusted to reduce the oil flow when the compressor is started up again. This might also be caused by too much heat in the affected area. If this is the case, the flow of cooling water through the water jackets should be increased. After cleaning all the valve parts, inspect them carefully for any signs of wear, such as chips along the edge of the valve seat where the channel goes. If you find any wear along the seat, grind it to ensure a flat seating surface for the channels. Surface grinding is done on a grinding machine. It actually removes a fraction of the metal surface and it tends to leave tiny scratches in the surface of the metal which can interfere with the valve operation. So it's necessary to lap the surface to remove these scratches after the grinding is completed. Lapping is done by applying a thin coat of lapping compound to a lapping block. Then you place the valve seating surface down and apply light pressure using a figure eight motion. After cleaning the lapping block, this procedure is repeated using progressively finer grades of lapping compound until you've got the right finish. Then all traces of lapping compound must be removed. Otherwise, it will interfere with the next process, bluing. Bluing is the process used to check the seating surface to be sure that there are no high or low spots. To do this, you apply a thin coat of bluing to a surface plate. Then place the valve seating surface down on the plate and turn it one quarter turn. Remove the valve and check the seat. You should see a thin, even coat of bluing. Areas of uneven bluing indicate that the surface isn't flat yet. So it should be lapped and blued again until it's right. The next step is to thoroughly remove all traces of bluing. Once this is done, you know you have a good seating surface. Then you can start to put the valve back together. The first step is to attach the channel guides to the valve seat. Then you replace the channels and their leaf springs. Make sure each channel is replaced in its proper guide. The last step is to put the stop plate in place and replace the screws that hold the valve together. Remember that if you performed any resurfacing, the old channels and springs must be replaced. Otherwise, they won't seat properly due to resurfacing. Before you can put the valve back into the cylinder, though, you have to check the channel lift. Excessive lift could cause early failure. Now, we've removed some metal from the seating surface by grinding and lapping and this would increase the lift of the channel. To check the lift, you use a dial indicator. Mount the indicator so that its stem touches the channel. Set the indicator so that it reads zero. This gives you a reliable reference point for taking the readings. Slowly press down on the channel, forcing it open. Be careful not to bump the valve or the indicator. The amount the indicator moves indicates the lift of the channel. If the lift of the channel is not within the range of specifications set in the manufacturer's manual, you have two choices. You can either replace the valve or machine the step that the valve seat sits on. After you've reassembled the valve, the next step is to refasten its inner cover.
Now, you can begin the next phase of this procedure, putting the valve back into the casing. First, the two valve gaskets must be replaced. One of them provides a seal between the valve and the cylinder. The other provides a seal between the outer cover and the casing. When placing the valve into the casing, make sure that the inlet valve goes into the inlet port. If you make the mistake of putting the inlet valve into the discharge port, the valve won't work, and it could cause excessive pressure that would damage the valve and piston rings. Another thing to watch out for when you're putting the valve into the casing is that the channels are lined up with the piston so that no turbulence is created. When the channels are put in parallel to the piston, the valve opens and shuts smoothly. Now that the valve is in the cylinder, you can replace the outer cap on the casing and bolt it in place. Next, tighten the bolt which is threaded through the outer cover. This bolt presses on the inner cover and holds the valve in place. The last step is to tighten the nut. This prevents air from leaking out around the bolt. Well, that covers our discussion of compressor valves. We've talked about three types of valves, feather, plate, and channel valves, and we've seen how they work. Then we also removed a channel valve, looked at some typical repair procedures, and then reassembled it and put it back in the compressor. In the next segment, we're going to disassemble and inspect the cylinder of a typical reciprocating compressor. But before we do, why don't you read over the material we've just covered in the text? If you have any questions, be sure to bring them up with your instructor. In this segment, we're going to begin our discussion of overhaul procedures by showing how to disassemble, inspect, and make repairs on the cylinder section of a reciprocating compressor. This is necessary because during a routine inspection of the compressor, some problems were found. The discharge gauge showed low pressure and the piston rod is worn. When we were troubleshooting this compressor, we determined that the compression loss is probably due to worn piston rings. They'll need to be replaced. The piston rod has been worn down by the action of the old wipers and must also be replaced. Both of these jobs require taking the cylinder apart. We've narrowed the problem down to the high pressure cylinder of this two cylinder, two stage compressor because the intercooler pressure gauge read normal. On this compressor, the first step is to drain the water from the head. To do this, you have to remove the drain plug at the bottom of the head. Next, Remove the cooling water discharge pipe, both from the funnel and from the head. Once this step is completed, you're ready to remove the head. You don't have to set up rigging because this head is recessed into the cylinder and held in place by nuts threaded onto cylinder studs. These studs will support the head while you're removing the nuts. Once the last nut has been removed, you need to install two jacking bolts. They're used to break the head loose from the cylinder casing. First, tighten the bolts by hand. Then use a wrench to tighten them. Tighten them alternately to ensure that the head is forced evenly away from the cylinder. Here, a portable table is used to support the head. Once the table's in position, the jacking bolts are turned to force the head completely off the studs. Then, with the help of another mechanic, you can pull the head off. Next, you remove the packing and oil wipers.
This should be done before the piston rod is pulled. Otherwise, the threads on the rod could be damaged. With the packing and oil wipers out of the way, the next thing to do is to make witness marks on the crosshead and the piston rod to make sure that the piston rod gets back in the right place when the compressor is reassembled. The piston rod position is very important in making sure that the piston doesn't hit one of the cylinder heads when the compressor is started up. One witness mark is made on the crosshead and the other on the piston rod. With a divider set so that one tip is in each witness mark, you measure the distance between the tips of the divider. This measurement tells you how far the piston rod is screwed into the crosshead. Always write such measurements down. Don't rely on your memory. Now you're ready to remove the piston and piston rod. The first thing to do is to remove the cotter pin from the crosshead. The cotter pin goes through the piston rod and keeps it from turning. You also need to loosen the piston rod lock nut. Now you're ready to unscrew the piston rod from the crosshead. To do this, you attach a strap wrench to the piston rod. The strap wrench enables you to get a good hold on the piston rod and makes it easier to unscrew it from the crosshead. After the piston rod has been unscrewed, you remove the piston and piston rod from the cylinder. With the table in position, you screw an eye bolt into the piston. This enables you to pull the piston out. With the piston removed, it's inspected for signs of wear. These wear marks were found on the bottom of this piston. Now you need to inspect the cylinder. Look for a lack of lube oil, a scored cylinder, excessive carbon buildup, and any other indications of damage. An inside micrometer is used to check to see whether or not the cylinder is out of round. This check should include the entire length of the cylinder to make sure that the cylinder isn't tapered. These readings are compared with the manufacturer's specifications. You'll find that there is a maximum amount that a cylinder can be worn out of round and still be reused. If the out of roundness exceeds specifications, the cylinder needs to be rebored. Now, reboring is a process which actually removes a minute section of the metal from inside the cylinder. If you should need to rebore the cylinder, you'll also need to install new oversized rings. Now, we won't go into the details of reboring here, as it's a special procedure. A somewhat similar process is honing. Every time you replace the piston rings, you should hone the cylinder. This process trues up the cylinder and leaves its surface a little rough. The rough surface helps the rings wear into the cylinder more quickly. Now that you've inspected the cylinder, it's time to start on the piston. First, clean off all the carbon deposits using a scraper or a wire brush. Be careful not to damage the piston while you're cleaning it. After most of the carbon is off, use an emery cloth to remove the remaining deposits. Just dip the emery cloth into solvent and rub the piston. The solvent helps loosen the carbon. When the piston is finally clean, you can check those wear marks we found earlier with an outside micrometer. The first measurement should be the diameter of the piston, including the wear marks. The next reading is taken 90 degrees from the first. More readings are taken further back on the piston to check that it's round and even. The last step is to check the manufacturer's manual to make sure the measurements are within specifications. If they're not, the piston must be replaced. The piston rod is inspected too. The oil wipers have worn this one down. To take out the piston rod, 
you have to remove the cotter pin from the piston rod nut. Then you remove the piston rod nut itself. To do this, you need to keep the piston rod from turning. It's okay to use a chain wrench to hold this rod because it's damaged and needs to be replaced. But if the rod was in good shape, you'd use a strap wrench, for instance, to make sure that it didn't get scratched while you were taking it out. The chain wrench will keep the piston rod from turning. You need a striking wrench to remove the nut. Sometimes the nut's hard to remove because of carbon deposits. If this is the case, it helps to spray penetrating oil on the threads. Once you've got the piston rod nut off, you use a press to take the piston rod off the piston. You can use a strong back and a hydraulic jack to press it off. First, you screw the bolts that hold the strong back in place into the piston. Then you position the hydraulic jack between the strong back and the piston rod. As you pump, the hydraulic action presses the piston rod out of the piston. Once it's off, you can remove the piston rod, unscrew the bolts holding the strong back, and move the hydraulic jack out of the way. Next, you need to check the piston to ring groove clearances. This is done by inserting a feeler gauge in the ring groove to measure the space or clearance between the ring groove and the ring. Check your measurements against manufacturer's specifications and make sure it's within the acceptable range. The next step is to remove the ring so that you can check the ring end gap. Place each ring into the cylinder and measure the end gap with a feeler gauge. Then compare your measurements with the range of tolerance stated in the manufacturer's manual. If the measurement is not within the acceptable range, you'll have to replace the rings. Use a scraper and solvent to clean out the grooves. The solvent loosens the carbon so the scraper can remove it more easily. After you've done all you can with the scraper, use an emery cloth and more solvent to finish the job. Now you're ready to install new rings. To do this, spread each ring apart just enough to get it around the piston. Be careful not to spread it too much or it could break. Then move the ring down the piston until you've got it in the ring groove. There's one last component to check before beginning reassembly, the cylinder lubricator. To check the lubricator, first turn the handle to pump oil into the cylinder. Check the hole in the cylinder carefully to make sure that the oil flows freely out of it because carbon can clog the hole and stop the oil flow. If the oil flows freely, the cylinder is ready for reassembly. If it doesn't, you'll have to check out the lubricator more thoroughly. If that's not the answer, you may have a clogged pipe. At this point, you probably have some questions that need answering. So turn off the tape Read through this section of your text and get some answers to those questions from your instructor. Okay, now we're on our way to putting this compressor back together. The first thing we're going to do is to get the piston ready to go back into the cylinder. After that, we're going to grind in the new piston rod. With these tasks out of the way, we'll be ready to start reassembly. Remember, there were some wear marks on the bottom side of the piston, which made it slightly out of round.
Well, after checking the manufacturer's manual, we found that the piston was still within specifications, so it does not have to be replaced. But in order to ensure that the piston wears evenly, we're going to rotate the worn bottom side to the top when we place the piston back in the cylinder. This will ensure even wear and a longer life for the piston. Now to avoid losing track of which side is which, we'll put a T for top on the worn side and a B for bottom on the opposite side. The last thing we'll do before beginning reassembly is grind the piston rod into the piston. Now this is necessary whenever a piston rod's replaced to ensure a smooth, even fit. The fit must be perfect. A fit that is too loose initially will loosen even further during operation. To begin the grinding in process, put a few dabs of a coarse lapping compound on the piston rod. Then insert the piston rod into the piston and begin to rotate the rod back and forth. When the back and forth motion between the piston and piston rod becomes easier and smoother, that's an indication that the lapping compound has worn down and needs replacing. Clean the worn down lapping compound off the rod and piston and wipe away all remaining residue with a clean cloth and solvent. Then apply more lapping compound and continue grinding in until you feel that the piston and piston rod are making good contact. There'll be some resistance between the piston and the rod. Do you remember how bluing was used to check the results of lapping a valve seat? Well, you do the same thing to check the results of grinding in. Apply a thin layer of Prussian blue evenly around the entire piston rod and wipe off any excess. Then, insert the piston rod into the piston and rotate it a quarter of a turn. Remove the piston rod and inspect the opening in the piston. If you can see a uniform ring of blue, the grinding in process is complete. Good contact has been made between the piston and the rod. If the ring pattern were not uniform, we'd need to repeat the process. Once the grinding in process is complete, the piston and piston rod can be reassembled. Insert the piston rod into the piston and lay the unit on its side. Next, Screw the piston rod nut onto the piston rod. This nut has to be tight, so use a striking wrench and a hammer. While tightening the piston rod nut, check its position to be sure that a cotter pin can be inserted through the hole in it. With the piston rod nut tightened and in place, you're ready to place a new cotter pin through the nut and the piston rod. After the cotter pin is inserted, bend it to secure it in place. Now you're almost ready to place the piston into the cylinder. But before you do, check that the gland follower and the oil wiper holders are still in place. If they aren't, you'll probably have some difficulty getting the piston assembly into the cylinder. Then screw two long bolts into the piston. These bolts will help you hold the piston when you're putting it into the cylinder. They also give you something to hold onto when you're screwing the piston rod into the crosshead. The last thing to do before putting the piston into the cylinder is to spread the appropriate oil all over the piston and piston rod.
This oil helps the piston slide smoothly into the cylinder and supplies initial lubrication when the compressor is first started. Now you're ready to put the piston into the cylinder. It usually takes more than one person to do this. You might want to use a portable table to support the piston assembly. Slide the piston into the cylinder up to the point of the rings. Be careful not to let the rings hit the cylinder. If they bump against the cylinder, they could break. These piston rings can be compressed by hand as you see here, but sometimes a ring compressor is used. A ring compressor is a device which compresses the rings into the piston grooves. This helps the piston fit easily into the cylinder. The next step is to screw the piston rod lock nut onto the piston rod. Then you can screw the piston rod into the crosshead. With the piston rod in position against the crosshead, turn the piston by two long bolts. Screw the piston rod into the crosshead until you have the piston in approximately the right place in the cylinder. You'll make a final adjustment later, but for now, a visual check of how far the piston rod is screwed into the crosshead will do. Now you can put the head back on the cylinder. Again, a portable table is needed to help support the weight of the head. Don't forget to put on a new gasket. Spray a lubricant on the head seating surface first to help prevent the gasket from sticking the next time the head's removed. It usually takes two people to lift the head up and place it on the cylinder. Put the nuts on the studs and tighten them securely with a wrench. Remember to tighten the nuts in an opposite pattern to ensure even contact between the head and the cylinder. The head is now secured in position. This brings us to another critical point in the reassembly procedure, adjusting the piston end clearance. Piston end clearance measurements are taken at two points, between the top of the piston and the top head, and between the bottom of the piston and the bottom head. To take these measurements, you need to remove one valve from the top end of the cylinder and one valve from the bottom end. Then insert a piece of soft solder larger than the specified clearance through the valve port to a point between the piston and the head. This procedure is the same for measuring both the top and bottom clearances. Rotate the crankshaft by hand to get the piston moving. Move the piston through its top or bottom dead center depending upon which clearance is being measured. This will compress the solder. Then remove the solder and measure the compressed section with a micrometer. Compare the measurement with the specification in the manufacturer's manual and make any necessary adjustments by screwing the piston rod in or out of the crosshead as needed. One way to do this is to attach a strap wrench to the piston rod through the side opening of the compressor. This opening lets you adjust piston end clearances with the head in place. Another way to measure piston end clearances is to use feeler gauges instead of solder. This method's covered in your text. When the piston end clearance is correct, tighten the piston rod lock nut and insert a new cotter pin. The lock nut and the cotter pin prevent the piston end clearance from changing when the compressor's in operation. The next step is to put on the new oil wipers. These oil wipers come in three segments which are held together by a garter spring. To make sure the oil wipers are put together properly, the segments are match marked by the manufacturer. These oil wipers also have a grooved side which faces the crankcase. 
The groove ensures that the oil that's wiped off the piston rod flows back into the crankcase. The next step is to place the new packing in the stuffing box. The packing is a special kind that is made just for reciprocating air compressors. Always check the manufacturer's manual to be sure you're using the right kind of packing. After the packing is in the stuffing box, tighten the gland follower just enough to hold the packing in place. This is just a preliminary adjustment which will be completed later. The next important adjustment you have to make is to the crosshead, so you can be sure it'll maintain the piston rod and the piston in the correct horizontal position. To determine if any adjustments are needed, mount a dial indicator in the opening in the side of the compressor so that its stem rests against the surface of the piston rod. After zeroing the dial indicator, rotate the main shaft one complete turn while watching the dial. Changes in the reading may mean that the piston rod is either tilted or bent. If the piston rod is tilted, the reading will either increase or decrease as the piston moves through its upstroke and return to zero as the piston moves through its downstroke. Now if the rod is bent, the change in the reading is a little different. The reading will both increase and decrease as the piston moves through its upstroke. A bent piston rod must be replaced. But if the piston rod is tilted, you must adjust the position of the crosshead until the rod is no longer tilted. The parts of the crosshead show up more clearly here. It has a wearing shoe and two guides, a board guide in the frame and a top guide bar. The piston rod screws into the crosshead here and the connecting rod attaches to the crosshead here. There are shims between the crosshead and the wearing shoe. By removing or inserting shims in this space, you can adjust the position of the crosshead so that it will maintain the piston rod and the piston in the correct horizontal position. After the crosshead is adjusted, you can reconnect the cooling water discharge pipe to the head and the compressors back together. Well now, the reassembly process is complete. But there are still some important jobs to attend to. First, you have to check the operation of the compressor after the tags have been cleared by the proper personnel. Listening and feeling for leaks coming from gaskets, valves, and piping connections is the first thing you should do. You also need to check the discharge pressure and compare it to the figures in the manufacturer's manual and the operator's logbook. The oil wipers are checked to make sure that no oil is leaking out around the piston rod. If everything is in order, a final adjustment is made to the packing by tightening the gland follower. There should be a minimum of leakage without any signs of heat buildup. But you're not quite done yet. Only after you've made sure that the work area is clean, free of tools, oil spills, and other job hazards, are you truly finished with the job. That's it. The compressor's repaired and back on the line, supplying compressed air wherever it's needed in the plant. You've seen how a typical two-cylinder, double-acting, horizontal, two-stage reciprocating air compressor works. You know how compressor valves function and how to repair them. And you've learned how to troubleshoot and repair some common problems that can occur in reciprocating compressors. I think you can understand why skilled mechanics are needed to tackle a job of this size and importance. With the knowledge you've gained from this program, you're well on your way to developing those skills and becoming a more valuable mechanic. <laughs>